First of all, all of the defensive people are, are strong, not too agile. Well, I always felt that after you went through all that work, the only thing you had to show for it was the film. And you got to keep the film. I mean, that's the backbone. That's what it all goes back to. That's the heritage, the film. The old Bibles, the bones in the ground, they dig them up. Well, let's hope that we don't have to go through it again. Stanley, I'd like to see him die out there. Let him go. We won, we won, man. We, we finished up with the win. As the 1960s came to a close, America was changing. And so was the game of professional football. At a time when the establishment and the anti-establishment were trying to live together, the same thing was happening in football. The NFL and AFL finally agreed to a merger. And you could walk into a locker room then and you'd see veteran players with crew cuts dressing next to rookies who looked like they just got off the bus from Woodstock. No one knew where the game was headed or what shape it might take. We just knew it was going to change. And at NFL Films, we knew that we'd have to change with it. In the late 1960s, pro football was flourishing on the field and at the game. Fans were coming out to the games in record numbers, and they were filling the same old stadiums they had filled for generations. The dirt infields in places like Cleveland gave the game a sort of a timeless quality that traditionalists loved. But when it rained, the dirt turned to mud. And when it didn't rain enough, the field would dry out and pretty soon Joe Namath was vanishing in a cloud of dust. The league felt that with the game growing and evolving, the playing surface should evolve along with it. And that's when several teams had artificial turf installed in their stadiums. Now they felt that this space age surface would be faster and better suited for the new wide open brand of football. We filmed the first installation of AstroTurf at Franklin Field in Philadelphia. It was 1969. And I remember thinking, what a shame it was to tear up that grass field. Uh, gosh, that's where Chuck Bednarik and Norm Van Brocklin once played. And now in its place, they put down 100 yards of outdoor carpet. To me, it, it just didn't look like a football field. It looked like an oversized pool table. And I thought my dad, you know, being an old school kind of guy, he would really hate this stuff. But he didn't really care one way or the other. I just heard about it and I saw it, but I was not interested in AstroTurf. How did it affect our films, though, AstroTurf? I don't know. I don't think it did, or did it. I didn't, I was, I never, uh, I don't you know what. AstroTurf, though? Uh, me? Yeah. No. I, you know, I don't know why. That's a strange question. I, AstroTurf, what the hell is that? Well, let's, like, let's talk about this cardboard. Or lighting. I don't know what AstroTurf was. Yeah, but the players had to play on this. Yeah, I know. So that's their job. I'm filming, not playing. Roll two. Lentos. Two. Back then, most football people saw this new surface as a giant leap forward for the sport. Ah, I think it's great. We played out in Seattle and we ordered a strip of this thing about two weeks ago for this game to practice on. It's, it's great. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's kind of it feels good, though. I'm not going to mind the heat reaction working out on you. Our trainers have told us, for example, that sprained ankles, muscle pulls, and everything else, uh, a lot of it has to do with inconsistency of the playing surface. Part of the consideration in uh, the injury pattern is the environment in which the individual performs. And I think with a consistent uh, standardized surface on which to play, that there will undoubtedly be fewer injuries overall. The only disadvantage I see is that if you hit the ground, you might bounce up a little too high and the guy might knock you down again. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the things of the future, and I feel that in the near future, all the National Football League and American League stadiums will have the AstroTurf. Even guys who looked like they played with Bronco Nagurski liked AstroTurf, at least at first. The teams put in the surface hoping it would make the game safer. But the same hatchet men were out there every week, and they were inflicting the same kind of damage they always did. Lonnie Stickles, number 85 for the 49ers, he was one of those players. 
he dealt out punishment for nine seasons. He offered no apologies then, and he offers none now. I was a guy that uh, just went to work every Sunday. But once you start pounding on me, I'm going to play to hurt you and beat you any way I can. You were the enemy, and I really wanted to destroy you. I didn't care about you personally, your personal life, anything like that. Uh, you had a different color on, and if I could wreck your leg or break your arm or knock your teeth out, I would. I played very aggressively, a lot of times dirty, took cheap shots. I taped my wrist, the bone of my wrist, so I wouldn't break that. And I just time it, measure it, so I'd get him right in the line, right in the throat. Hit him right up under the throat. <laughs> Stumble. Teams would send 11 guys after me sometimes. But I played nine years, so <laughs> not much of it worked. <laughs> and then years later when I was breaking down, they just threw me on the old scrap heap. <laughs> there was a lot of vicious play in that era. But the league discouraged us from showing it. That's why these plays were never aired until now. You see, the league felt that showing these hits would make the game appear too violent. And yet George Hallis, the founder of the game, always wanted these hard hits in his highlight film. He would call up and he'd say, hard hitting is legal. And he said, the game is built on the premise that a good player becomes less good when he's hit so hard that he doesn't want to be hit again. You have to remember, there weren't as many games on network TV as there are now, and there weren't as many highlight shows replaying all the action. But when the league started losing stars, like Chicago's Gail Sayers, well, there was no concealing that. The fear was, if the violence went unchecked and more and more of these marquee players were knocked out by the hatchet men of the league, the game would suffer. So officials cracked down on late hits, clotheslining, spearing, and other dangerous tactics. But even played within the rules, pro football was still a violent game. And that'll never change. In 1968, we filmed the first combined NFL-AFL draft in a cramped New York City ballroom. Today, the coat check room at the draft is bigger than this. Yeah, Back then, former mortal enemies sat side by side and peacefully divvied up the college talent. But this forgotten footage shows that the selection process was still a work in progress. I know I'm in the way. I'm going to get this microphone in face. Out of way, my ass. Hit it for me because I'm, I'm up here taking a reading, okay? Good like at that. As always, NFL Commissioner Pete Rosell kept his cool in the midst of chaos. The Buffalo Bills select. Hold on, hold on. Camera's not ready. You have to remember that Pete was a former PR man, so he knew how and when to deliver his lines. The Buffalo Bills select as their first choice in the first round, halfback O.J. Simpson, the University of Southern California. And first I would like to ask Howard his general impression of uh, his observations of the draft this morning. I find it a rather tedious bore, Ed. Mm -hmm. Hard to describe one's reaction to men spending the utter limit of 15 minutes on draft selections when they've had an entire year. Multi-thousands of dollars, as you know, expended on scouting, computerized systems, and yet if somebody takes a player before somebody else, there has to be a sudden, complete revision, apparently, in someone's thing. It's utterly absurd, and a manifestation of inefficiency inconsistent with the kind of efficiency that you have brought to professional football with your own operation, NFL Films. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, Jack, uh, do you concur in uh, Mr. Cosell's uh, statement? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Jack, that's very good. Thank you. A lot of people said that Howard was, uh, oh, they had every adjective in the world, arrogant, conceited, full of himself. Uh, yeah, he was. But strangely enough, a lot of the things he said were true. It seems to me a mistake to limit an authentic genius merely to film. I think that uh, in the reorganized structure, Pete can move on to industry where he more properly belongs, and you can assume the coveted role of commissioner. Would you answer the phone, uh, Jack, please? You're not doing a damn thing else here. <laughs>
All right, that's it. We'll print that. <laughs> Play it for Rosé. <laughs> okay. Let's roll one. Lou Saban, Steve Sabo. With the merger, NFL Films gained a whole new cast of characters, including one of my all-time favorites, Denver coach Lou Saban. Why don't you ought to know how to run that pattern by this time? Get inside where you belong. God's sakes, man. Right from the start, Lou was great for us because he was so intense and passionate and honest. And today, at the age of 79, he hasn't changed a bit. I don't know if he were to take wins and losses. I, he couldn't say I was very successful. I thought I did the best I could with the teams that we had. But uh, I think my greatest strength was that uh, I was up front. Uh, I had nothing to hide. I know a lot of coaches that uh, maybe they burn within. And maybe they keep it within their guts. But myself, I think most of it's on the surface. And <laughs> maybe this isn't the best way to do it, but at least it eliminates possibilities of ulcers and so on and so forth. I'm not going to give you any trouble today. Your attention, please. <laughs> I don't promise that to you, though. I, I lose myself into the game because it's genuine. There's nothing phony about it. There's nothing phony about our business. Either you do it or you don't do it. We really understand we go on stage at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We wired Saban for sound several times, and unlike some coaches who worried how they would come across on camera, Lou never changed his style. Every time we put a mic on him, he told me the same thing. If I said it, you can use it. I said, now, Steve, you got to understand if I wear it, you might have a tape full of bleeps. <laughs> he said, no. He said, we'll cut the bleeps out. Guys! Come down in there, Dallas! What the hell's the matter with you guys? Be alert! I tell you, it's going to cost Dedeke, and it's going to cost Dedeke, Dedeke! A chip myrtle fushy, uh, I love dearly, but I, he used to give me grief like you can't ever believe. Come on, now, chip in! I wanted to get Chip's attention. I said, chip, chip, chip! 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 Stand it down! Play football! My daughter could do better! My daughter could! You're chicken! You're full of chicken manure! <laughs> and I, I, I was astounded by what I had said, you know. <laughs> we know Chip might call me and say, Hey, coach, you're full of chicken <laughs> If we get the crack, he scores! Another sideline foil was assistant coach Whitey Duvall. And I looked at Woody, I said, are you sure this guy can play? He says, give him a little more time, give him a little more time. How much more time are we going to give him? Woody, I just said to you now, I just said to you, well, throw on first and ten. Blitz. And bingo, he goes right over this young kid again, he flattens him. And I looked at Woody, he said, they're killing me, Woody, they're killing me. And every place I go now, the first thing they say, Lou, they're killing me, Whitey. That's an opening statement. I'd like to see him die out there. Let him go. And it just tore me up because I wasn't a part of that action. I was the guy on the sideline, and I couldn't do anything but direct traffic, so to speak. Lou Saban wasn't the winningest coach we ever wired, but in one area, he was by far the best. He led the league in classic quotes. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you gotta get it done. Yeah. The, the greatest hits of Blue Saban, I do like <laughs> that. The NFL players of the early 60s were from the old school. You could see it in their faces, and you could see it in the way they played. Larry Wilson played part of one season with two broken hands. And what I remember about Larry is that he used to leave his false teeth in his locker when he took the field. If you weren't tough, you just couldn't play. When the Colts Dennis Gaubatz, number 53, chases down the Rams' Tommy McDonald, he makes sure to put a good hard lick on him. And you'll notice Tommy's teammate, Marlon McKeever, number 86, he doesn't say a word. We could probably get away with a little more aggression than, than what they get away with now. I look at some of the things that they get fined over now, and I think it's ridiculous, quite frankly. But that's the mentality that the, the sport has developed. Like most old school players, McKeever could take a hard hit like this one with no hard feelings. That's the way the game was played. McKeever played his first six seasons as a linebacker, then he switched to tight end where he made the Pro Bowl. He was later switched back to linebacker, but he never complained. 
to me, it was just the idea that if I was going to play and if I had to be an end, I was going to play at end. And if they needed someone at linebacker, I, I would play linebacker. These guys were tough, rugged guys. But you already know that, having met Monty Stickles. Here's Monty again, number 87, when he played with the Saints. Oh, I don't know. I think maybe he's gotten a little tougher since he's gotten a little older. I don't know if he was really that dirty at all. That may be what he felt. I didn't feel that. He's a blowhard. <laughs> Another old school player was Bill Glass, number 80 of the Browns. Glass was one of the hardest hitting linemen of that era. Yet he was also a man of deep and outspoken religious conviction. Bill, since you talk of a god of love, how can you play a game of violence? Well, really, I think that um, this game that you call violence, of course, has rules, and I try to abide by the rules as best I can. I think that as long as you play within the rules, you need to play with your whole heart. And I know that it's a rather violent game in the thinking of some, but I believe that it gives me an opportunity, a platform from which I can communicate my faith such as nothing, nothing else could do. I've got the joy, 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 joy. We filmed one of Glass's tours, but the footage you're seeing is footage we didn't use back then. That's because Bill was so conservative and so critical of the 60s counterculture, we felt airing it would just create more controversy. After our game in San Francisco last year, we went through the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco. We had the privilege of uh, visiting this hippie area of San Francisco. And I have respect for the hippie as long as he's genuinely searching for something, for a meaning to his world. But when the hippie, like many of these out there in San Francisco have done, use this as an excuse to their own laziness and to their own mediocrity, then I have no respect whatsoever for them. In fact, I was amazed as I walked through that area because you could actually smell them before you saw them. The people there, many of them, just don't seem to care about life. They've escaped to a world of dope or alcoholism. And they've said, we're being ourselves. But the amazing thing is they must mean they're being their worst self. Certainly they couldn't mean they're being their best self. Now, Glass wasn't alone in his disdain for the so-called flower children. A lot of the old school players felt that way. But by the end of the decade, that younger generation was sending its best athletes to the NFL, and they changed the face and the fashion of the game. Players like Eagles linebacker Tim Rosevich came right off the college campus into the NFL and brought that free-spirited attitude with them. Well, there was a whole new, uh, whole new culture, as they say now, and uh, they were a little wild, and I didn't speak their language very much, but they presented a whole new picture uh, that wasn't, uh, that I wasn't used to. So I think I let Steve handle that. <laughs> that was his generation. Dad's right. This was my generation. That's me leaning against the wall. Look at those clothes and that hair. That looked like a roadie for the monkeys. I was filming San Diego halfback Dickie Post for a special we did called The New Breed. And the show explored the issue of the 60s athlete, his adjustment to the NFL and the NFL's adjustment to him. Dickie was an exciting runner who led the Chargers in rushing three straight years. Let's start with we followed him off the field to his clothing store in San Diego. You look at this stuff now, and it looks like we're filming in Austin Powers' closet. Probably pocket like this. Yeah. Our lighting crew blew out the fuse box in Dickie's store, but you have to remember, you know, we were still learning how to do our job, too. Oh. So we moved outside to San Diego's Balboa Park. The idea was to film him doing an imaginary concert. That's me coaching Dickie on how to play the air piano. Now, the hat was Dickie's idea. You look at it now, and it's like we were crossing Billy Jack with Billy Joel. I always thought The New Breed was one of the most interesting films we ever made because it spoke to what was happening in America at the time, but in a fun way. At least, I thought it was fun. Some NFL owners disagreed. In fact, two of them sent angry letters to my father. They said that, uh, we saw your show... Uh, the new breed, and uh, we don't want those elements of society represented in the NFL. You know, we were confused because we thought this was a way to appeal to the young people and to show that the game was contemporary, and football's always been a mirror of our culture. Then the letter ended, NFL Films is soiling the nest. 
They said the scenes of Rosevich making candles on the beach were, and these were their exact words, subversive and immoral. I mean, he was making candles on the beach for crying out loud. But those were the differences that defined America during that time. With the new breed, we addressed those points, and hopefully, we made a few people smile at the same time. Sticky Sid, break. Big play, big play now. I had a unique connection with Tim Rosevich, number 82. For two years, I shared an apartment with Tim and Gary Pettigrew. Gary's the defensive tackle to Tim's right, number 88. When their careers ended, they both moved back to the West Coast. But I thought it would be fun if we got together again. So we did. Naturally, I captured it all on film. This is a story that I was not privileged to, but I remember about the donuts. It, you know, when the reporters used to come in and there would be the big thing of donuts. Yeah. Now, you don't know what I'm, uh, Gary, yes. you know the story, well, right? Of course, of course, Tim doesn't remember very conveniently because he is the one in the middle of the donut, or the donut was in the middle of Tim. Yeah. Now, you, know, you don't remember that because this is a great I don't remember story. how many donuts. We're never going to be able to use it. We're never going to be able to use it. But it's just, it's just well, a, you know, some treasures are best left lost. Yeah, but you get the idea. What we had, the three of us, was more like a lab experiment than a living arrangement. I was this aspiring filmmaker rooming with two football players who themselves were very different. We clashed instantly. Maybe that's why we became friends. But we were very different. Tim's whole attitude was, was, well, it's just like the difference between Northern California and Southern California. He was that L.A. type, and I wasn't. Ah, oh, that makes me sick. He was right out there, there, right out in your face, and all the time. <laughs> we got to make up for it, though. We got to oh, yeah, we we get one hit, and we'll straighten it out. Yeah, we got to touch But it was interesting, the dynamics, because there were players that resented you because they felt, you know, Pettigrew's a snob, he went to Stanford, he's an intellectual, and Rosso, they thought this guy was from Mars, you know, with the, the tie-dye T-shirts and the capes and the uh, rawhide necklaces and stuff, and there was I in the middle. And we didn't, <laughs> we didn't even know you. That's right. Where the hell do you fit in, anyway? Okay, so I didn't fit in. But no one fit in with Rosso, not even in the 60s. Rosso used to sleep on the floor. You know how he wouldn't go, you wouldn't use a bed. And I remember waking up and seeing Rosso would be laid out. You know, but just but, this like this. This is the way you'd wake up in the morning. You'd come out and he would be like this. Well, you know, the and reason you, you do you, know, you got to get up and step over him like that. And I say, you know, come Steve, on, Rosso, get Steve, up. So what the hell? And, and that was, wait a second. Now, that was because that you used to say you had to sleep with the magnetic Mag north. The magnet that your, the, your electrical waves had to go through it your body. It recharged your body. If you slept with your head towards the magnetic north, mm -hmm. it energized your body. Except that he wasn't sleeping. He was just he passed was out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't make me a bad person. No, not at all. You remember the times when we took old Dick Butkus' films and rolled him before the ball game and took a look at the way he, he used to take all of that whole thing on Butkus. Great hits. I remember the three of us just sitting around right. nice just talking about Butkus. Dick Butkus. He was a source of fascination for me as a filmmaker because he was such a primitive, visceral presence on the screen. And Tim and Gary identified with Butkus because, like them, he played on a losing team, but he never let the losing diminish his passion for the game. And a passion for football was one thing Tim, Gary, and I all had in common. The knowledge that I gained about football through Steve and his background helped, my, helped me play better. And uh, I think that uh, his inside information that he got from me as far as a player's attitude probably helped him be a better filmmaker. So it was a good relationship. We had a, a kind of a, a guinea pig menage a trois. <laughs> <laughs> what are they running? Are they running that trap in there? I'll never forget the day Timmy wore a microphone for NFL films. I shot the sideline camera, and for four quarters, I lived inside my roommate's world. Gary, nice tackle. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not doing anybody any good because I'm getting blocked away from the hole. Living with both you guys, it gave me a respect for the, the intelligence, the toughness, and the demands that the game put on the players. Living with you and, and knowing what you went through, not only physically. Got some analgesic, man. My, I got some torn muscles in my neck, man. But mentally, and the anguish, and especially the seasons that were bad. Oh, penalty. The, the way you guys would get beat up, and then the fans would boo you. Oh, shut up, man! 
on. The next Sunday, it was the same. You could see the energy start to build. All right, first down, first down. And then you'd be right back there again. We got to get another one right now, man. We come out in the second half and we just run over. It's such a pleasure to be able to play in the thing that your is your dream as you're growing up. Is is that's the thing that you know is mind-boggling to me that I actually ever got there. We won, we won, man. We we finished up with the win. I remember asking you one time, how can you stand doing this film business about football, traveling, watching, going over films, reading about it, you know, 12, 14 hours a day, day in, day out, 365 years, because it would make me puke. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, I love it. I really enjoy it, Gary. I really do. We played it. We, we got down and dirty and, and bloody and, uh, and injured. And uh, Steve has, has brought uh, what we know as football to, to the masses, to the public. Right. And, uh, and I can understand why he would enjoy that. Are you getting close to the end of a reel? I have to run into the, I have to run into the end of the reel. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, you guys get up and go ahead. We'll film you leaving. Okay. That's it. I'm going to pee now. All right, I'm uh, going to lay down be here. Right back. So go ahead. Gonna, don't let him fall down the stairs. I'm going to go take, a, take a rest. I'm going to rest. I, I, don't I, step on me. I'm laying on the floor. Should, I, the, should, the I, should I pee this between Gary's legs or? while he's peeing? Uh, or should I just, like, you know, I can pee over a bus. Oh, yeah. What? Well, we probably should move along now. I think this is it, Bill. Another Eagles player, halfback Timmy Brown, lived in the same apartment. And we became such good friends, Timmy and I, that I probably took his football career for granted. It wasn't until I looked through our film vault that I realized Timmy had some of the best footage of any runner in that era. But because he played for the losing Eagles, hardly anyone noticed. When Timmy left the game, he went to Hollywood and he made movies. Uh, he even appeared in the film version of M.A.S.H., but still, most people today don't remember his name. Super Bowl, row three, Sable, row By three. 1969, Timmy was winding up his career in Baltimore, but he and I were reunited on the Colts bench at Super Bowl three. I was shooting the sideline camera, and Timmy, that's him number two, he was a Colts backup, and he came over to talk a few times during the game. Once, it was late in the first quarter, and the Colts were just starting to realize that beating the Jets wasn't going to be as easy as they thought. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, we'll be all right. It's just we haven't relaxed. We score once and we'll get loose. Go ahead. Now, I wasn't really interviewing Timmy. I wasn't trying to be a sideline reporter. But at the same time, I knew that he might say something good, so I kept the camera rolling, even though, as you can see, it was pointed at the ground. Timmy didn't know we were recording, so I didn't use any of the sound in the original film. If Timmy had known we were rolling, I don't think he would have been as frank as he was. Just too tight. We just you made all the mistakes. Just too uptight. They're a good team, but we should beat them 20 points. Any way you look at it, it's just that they're getting every break in the book on their way. Maybe the guys are with them today. Maybe, I don't know what the hell it is, but... Did you think because you guys weren't, because of training, you were really tight, huh? I would say that was maybe. I don't want to knock anybody. It's not Chula's for any more than others, but a whole week since Sunday, since Saturday night we got down here, you're already tired from the trip. Then he gives us Saturday night off. Well, hell, everybody's beat. It's Sunday, 11 o'clock, bed check on. It's too much sitting around. The Colts lost, of course, and it was the last game Timmy ever played. One last frustration in a frustrating career. But the men who played against Timmy, they knew how great he was. They voted him into the Pro Bowl three times. But I'll always think of him as pro football's ultimate lost treasure. I've had a lot of frustration that I never fulfilled what was there, what was in me. People don't remember you. You know, um, Tim Brown, the Raiders? <laughs> nah, the original. The original. <laughs> I still have dreams. I come back. I'm always coming back. It's weird. I think, God, am I ever going to outgrow this? Let it go. But I had too much left. I had too much to give. I didn't get a chance to. But I come back, and uh, I always run that opening kickoff back. So they know. So they know, hey, don't question me. Don't question what I can do. What you got to do is give me the ball.
One of the first shows that brought attention to NFL films was our 1968 documentary, Lombardi. It was a one-hour primetime special that aired on CBS, and it was an intimate portrait of this legendary coach and his final days in Green Bay. Lombardi had that tough exterior. What's going on out here? Hey! And when I would come out and try to talk to him about filming his practice, no way! Sable! And he never knew my name. He called me Lou Saban for three years. The most surprising thing about the film was that my dad was able to talk Lombardi into doing it. This was the great Lombardi. He didn't open himself up to anyone. It took a long time to keep talking to him at every owner's meeting. Sometimes I'd get him when he'd be having his cocktail hour and say, Coach, you know, you got to let us do something. You're a legend. You've got to go down in history. And I think one of the lines that he loved best was when I finally said, You know, Coach, I'm going to make you the John Wayne of pro football. Oh, he liked that. He thought that that was a... Uh, from that time on, I started to make a few little inroads. You know, that line worked so well that we've used it on dozens of head coaches since then. Anytime a coach was reluctant to let us film a practice or wear a wire during a game, we'd say, but coach, we'll make you the John Wayne of pro football. We figured if it worked with Lombardi, it would work with anyone. To film Lombardi, my dad and I spent two months of that season in Green Bay. And everything in town revolved around football and the Packers. Everywhere you turned, even on the radio, you were reminded that this is football country. Good morning, 22 degrees. The WNFL temperature reading looks like it's going to be a beautiful day in Green We had to squeeze our whole crew into the back of Lombardi's car. You should have seen it. Three guys with cameras, wires, microphones, and all that equipment. We're all piled on top of each other in the back seat. I'm glad Lombardi didn't drive a compact or we really would have been in trouble. What made the show unique was the access that Lombardi gave us. He let us follow him through his day, beginning with mass each morning. Then he'd run some errands before going to the office. And we shot so much great stuff that what you're seeing here didn't even make the original show. Lombardi was so deep in thought most mornings, he'd forget we were in the car. And sometimes he'd leave his keys in the ignition. And we'd have to say, yo, coach, you forgot something. First of all, all of the defensive people are, are strong, but not too agile. Lombardi allowed our cameras into the team meetings, which were strictly off limits. Nobody had ever been allowed to do this. Short situation. Safety's up. But here's a back to the line, and brother is out. You never in your life seen anything more open than that. And he even invited us into his house to film a cocktail party. Lombardi was a great host. He loved to have people over. He loved to entertain. He loved a good joke. He wasn't a good storyteller, but he was a good audience, and he had that great laugh. During the film, by now, he got into it, and he became a producer. He said, now, tomorrow, Ed, this is what we're going to do. And I think you might like this. This is the nutcracker drill. You're going to watch that. The guy's going to get slammed around there. We're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And I'll tell you something else. I, I want you to, uh, I'm going to, I do my exercises every morning. I think a good shot would be working on the, the weights and the equipment and let the people know I keep in shape. That's enough of that. We don't stop. We don't stop. We don't stop. And then he got through with that and he is, I said, where are you going? I'm going to the steam room. Hey, not a bad idea. Take me in the steam room. And Mary would sit with a towel in the steam room. By now I had to sometimes fake the shots, not even roll film because I knew we'd never use it. But he, he began to like being filmed. I always admired him. There are a lot of things I liked about Lombardi. He was very fair. He had a lot of guts and courage, and he believed in what he was doing, and he was not a stoic type of coach. He was never boring. He was excitable. He was uh, fun to be next to. He, 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 sparks came out. He had a perfect storyline coming up the hard way and not getting into coaching until he was over 45 years old. Just like me, I didn't get into NFL films until I was 45 years old. But there he went to this little town and started from scratch and bingo, two NFC championships, Super Bowl. He was lonesome too. I remember I used to have dinner with him at some restaurant in Green Bay uh, almost every night. I felt a little self-conscious because I thought I was taking him away from his 
friends and his groups. And I said, you know, Vince, you don't have to eat with me. I could. He said, no. I said, Ed, I eat alone every night. When we were filming Lombardi during that 1967 season, we didn't realize he was suffering the onset of the stomach cancer that would take his life just three years later. Many times on the sidelines, he would suddenly bend over and hold his stomach. And I once asked him, I said, Vince, what are you doing? I see you do that a couple times a game. He said, nah, I just have a, I think it must be an ulcer or something. And he once told me he took about 15 aspirins a day. And I said, 15? He said, yeah, I've been doing that for years. I'm not a diagnostician. I didn't know what that meant. I just thought he had ulcers. And uh, all coaches have ulcers, I guess. I'd much rather. Lombardi denied his health was an issue when he stepped down as head coach in 1968. I would like to preface my remarks first by saying that I'm in excellent health. <laughs> and I believe in good physical condition. He stayed in Green Bay for one more year. Then he went to Washington as coach and general manager. Lombardi coached there only one year. Then his failing health forced him to resign. He died in September of 1970. He was just 57 years old. NFL films had come a long way from the days of wind-up Bell and Hal cameras and two-man crews. We now arrived at a game with a battalion of skilled personnel and cases full of the best camera and recording equipment that money can buy. All customized to our needs. We were young, yet experienced, energetic, but under control. And we attacked our job with a passion. And finally, we had found a voice that matched our imagination. I can still remember the first words that I wrote for John Facenda, and I remember tapping him on the shoulder, and the first words that he ever read for us were, it starts with a whistle and ends with a gun. And I, I just remembered that, remember thinking back and hearing that and knowing that, boy, we were on to something, uh, something really different. We're ready to go if you are. Okay. Uh, John, I'm He read our really scripts as if he were uh, an after-dinner speaker at the Last it's Supper. Script. Can I use the word frightfully rather than uh, frighting for Lily? I'm going to have trouble with that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, that is. That's a, that's a tough word. Okay, that's fine, because we still keep the alliteration. And okay. it's a good line, and I don't want to change it. Okay, thought. so it's okay. frightfully instead of frighteningly. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, now where else? Right from the very first... We call John Super the Bowl voice Bowl of God, but he wasn't nightmare. infallible. It was fiercely fought, but frightfully blocked. Let's take that over again. Okay, John, right from the top and no mistakes. We're rolling. The Chiefs responded to the Viking score by returning to the strategy. Oh, no. Middle back of Don Dan. Oh, shoot. John, be careful these next names. Not even the wizardry of Fred Belitnikoff. Eh, you bastard name there. Men like Eyeshide and Buhler. Buhler, you son of a bitch. I hope I didn't say that lasty word. Forgive me, Mayor Cooper, Mayor Cooper, Mayor Max McCooper. I have sinned before thee and God and everyone. Right from the very Our audience play. never heard the flaws, just the finely tuned Nightmare. instrument. It was fiercely fought, but frightfully flawed. You know, John was Italian and he loved the opera, and he would make notations in the, in the margin. Uh, this is very bass, this is trepid, oh, this is profundo. And he would have all these notations relating to a, a musical scenario there. He was using his voice as an instrument, is right. The only film John actually appeared in was one that nobody outside the company ever saw. He hosted the NFL film's softball team highlights. The 1970 baseball season for NFL films was one of frustration and hope. Frustration because of a lack of talent. Hope, well, let's hope that we don't have to go through it again. They had style, they were dedicated, they had poise, they had pride, they had execution, they had talent, they had hats and t-shirts. This whole movie represents the foundation that built NFL films. 30 years later, Lou Schmidt is still with us as a producer. Behind the camera that day was Jay Gerber, who became our head of production. My dad's driver was Ralph Caputo, 
who went on to build and maintain our facility in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Bob Ryan coined the phrase America's team in a Dallas Cowboy highlight, and today he's our editor-in-chief. Producer Phil Tuckett was hired after one year as a Chargers wide receiver. 32 years later, he had the idea to do a series called The Lost Treasures of NFL Films. John Hens was our first general manager, and he was the backbone of our early production staff. And of course, there was our head coach. I believe we have a real fine baseball team. We have some real fine hitters, real fine pitchers, real fine fielders. And barring any serious injuries on the field or venereal diseases, I think we should have a real fine season. When we found this old film, it reminded me of how much time has passed and how things have changed. John Hentz died suddenly in 1980 in the prime of his life, and we still miss his strength and his vision. John Facenda passed away six years later, but his voice will always be identified with NFL films. I love both of these men, and I'll never forget what they contributed to our company. In 1970, the game took on a whole new look with the merger of the AFL and NFL. For the first time, AFL and NFL teams met in the regular season, and this was the first game, Kansas City at Minnesota. Now, these teams had met nine months earlier in Super Bowl IV, and the Chiefs beat the Vikings convincingly. Minnesota coach Bud Grant used our film of that game. That's the one that Hank Stram was wired for sound. He used it to fire up his team for this rematch, and it worked. The Vikings hammered the Chiefs 27 to 10. But what mattered really was the big picture and the fact that the two leagues were now one, and the future of all the teams was brighter as a result. I guess I'll always have a, a warm feeling for the game of the 1960s. That was the decade when NFL Films was born, so it was like a whole new world opened to us. And if pro football and film was a perfect marriage, as people often say, then this decade was our honeymoon. The game was, was just unpretentious in a charming kind of way. You just don't see livestock grazing in the end zone anymore. It was a decade in which all of us, players, coaches, and fans, could see the future of the sport while still feeling close to its roots. These are the players and the personalities who built the game as we know it today. The Lost Treasures of NFL Films is our tribute to them.